Coming live from San Jose, California, USA is our guest tonight. Welcome to this very special edition of the KJ Masterclass Live, the show which ensures that you profit from your time spent here with experts, either through their industry insights, information, or simply learning from them. And today we have Richard Frayson, author of A Private Conversation with Money, who, and who works with leaders to gain rapport with their relationship with money, meaning, and success. Welcome to the show, Richard. Well, I'm very delighted to be here. And one of the things that intrigued me about your invitation was you said, let's just have a conversation like we're friends. So no lectures, no sales, no nothing. But I'm really looking forward to a very creative conversation. Right. And even though we'll be talking about friends, we'll also we'll be talking about money. Money. When friend, right. And money is something which everybody wants to eavesdrop on like they want to know what we are talking about and so let's let's talk about things about money about insights into money that you have talked in your book a private conversation with money let's make it public and let's talk what will what can be helpful for everybody for everybody wants money and money are for different purposes in life so tell us about this particular book of yours. Let's start from there. What is a private conversation with money about? Well, in our culture in the US, there's just a lot of internal conflicts that people have absorbed. And they absorbed from family belief systems. For example, in America, there'll be money doesn't grow on trees, wealthy people are evil, there's only so much to go around and the wrong people have it. Uh, we need more fairness. Uh, excess wealth is evil. So don't, if you become wealthy, you're going to become a jerk. Uh, uh, money is easy come, easy go. The universe provides money. So there's all these beliefs that are focused in on these, on these children. And as they grow up, these very deep beliefs either can help them or can hinder them in their own search for meaning, for money, and for sex in, success in their life. So in this book, Joe, who is a journalist, has every convoluted conflict with money and belief there is. We've just dumped it all on him. So as he has a conversation with a character who comes out of the blue and calls himself money, as he has this conversation, he deals with all of these conflicts. And by the end, He's developed rapport with money, meaning, and success. And the invitation is for the readers to follow along, follow along with his struggles so they can too also have this wonderful experience of rapport with money. Right, Richard. Why did you choose a journalist as the character in this book? You could have chosen some vice president. You have chosen a sales guy, a marketing guy, a digital marketer, or anybody else. Or, or even the president of the United States, but everybody is not as, uh, you know, rich as Trump. So why, why a journalist? You know, it, what's interesting about writing this book is that you think that, well, you have an idea in your brain, you plan it out, you write out the characters, and then you plan what they're going to say. Well, it turns out, in my experience was, I started writing and as I say this, I feel an emotion. These characters emerged. They had their own voices. They, some of the things, they surprised me. You know, I was typing away or I was using uh, speech to text and saying, and they said these things that I didn't expect them to say. <laughs> so the characters just emerged out of my desire to invite everybody to a better relationship with money okay okay uh, because i thought maybe it is because you were a futures brokers broker for merrill lynch and being on the floor you may have come across several journalists outside who would want to know about things and you found out uh, like that journalists are a poor lot actually not every journalist is rich and even they like like me i've been a journalist for most of my life working life and it was that's why I asked that question. Why a journalist? Now, if you talk purely from uh, now move from journalist 
Joe. Joe was the is the character. Mm -hmm. Yes, from Joe to me, then it will answer a lot more uh, for for a journalist in India and for the audience in India. That what do you see? Because here in India also uh, we have that sense that uh, money people need money, but they don't talk much about money in that sense and. Not everybody looks at all the businesses and uh, even in Bollywood uh, about richness, about wealthy people the same way that they actually do when they work for them. So what would you say? What do you say in this book? Is it about gaining, uh, becoming rich or is it about knowing about yourself better or knowing about money better? What is it that they can get from this book? <laughs> Yes to everything. The first step is awareness. So what this book does, it has a number of exercises. And in fact, uh, I'm there's I set up a special page for your listeners, um, and we can talk about it. Conversation dot money slash k a j, and on this yeah. page is an invitation to step into some exercises. So rather than just reading about my theory of money or what these uh, characters say, you can actually experience the exercises along with them. And this is a discovery process. So rather than saying, oh, here's an expert out here. He's telling me what I should do. I invite you to have some experiences. And then out of your own value system, you can then create behaviors that serve you better. The point is your values and rapport so that you're fully energized to from your value system to create behaviors. And I invite you to taste uh, the rapport with money, with meaning and wealth. And so all those other things that just in your head that just and subconscious routines, and I could tell you stories about some of them that keep you from your goals. Well, let's free you up so that you have the energy to move forward. Okay. Okay. And why is it, is it about just the cultural thing that binds you to yourself and do not think about, you know, creating value for you, uh, yourself? How does it work? Is it just a cultural thing? Or oh, is my it gosh. More, there is well, more, more to that. Yeah. Well, what you're bringing up is really important is the cultural part of it. Now, the cultural part of it is just one part. We have, as I mentioned, the family of upbringing how they treated money, did they argue about it, did they fight about it, did they uh, criticize wealthy people, did they, uh, like my parents are, was two different, well, it was easy come, easy go, if you got some, you just kind of blew it, blew it away, so you have all those embedded. Now we have a culture, and especially in the U.S., and you can enlighten me how it is in India, but where we have a huge divide uh, you know, on one says there's a pie, there's only so much of it, and it's not divided right, and we need to divide the pie better. There's an other part of the divide that says, hey, there's as much value as we want to create. There's no limited pie, and everybody can excel and who wants to, and everybody has an opportunity. Well, those are two very different cultural expectations. So we have the family, we have the culture, we have our peer group. And my clients have really good hearts. They're good people and they want to do the best for everybody. And they have all these conflicting messages that make it very difficult for them to not only take care of themselves, but add value to the world. So I think what you're pointing out is important. And it's not only culture, it's family, and it's our political divide now that is uh, creating internal conflicts. Right. But... Uh, don't parents everywhere want their kids to uh, earn good for themselves and they all want them to excel, make good money? Uh, why, why is it that, uh, is, is it that they tell them not to make good money? Is there a harm in that? Why, why is it, where is this cultural thing then coming in? Maybe as a thing like that you should not have obscene wealth, something that, you know, takes away uh, while in that process, you take away things from the community or you are, you know, almost like controlling the community or or, or a, a huge number of people in that process. That's a different thing. Or for businesses, as they say, 
they are too big. Uh, even they have uh, earnings m um, more than perhaps a sm uh, some small co countries and all. But that's a different matter. But generally okay, stop, people, stop. Uh, Hang on for a second. It's I'm going to argue, and I'm going to invite you to think about it. That those beliefs that are a different matter are still okay. subconscious. I don't want to become that. I don't want to take more from my community because I'm a good person. I don't want to have excess wealth. I don't want to have all these. Now, you you would think that you can say, okay, so I'm motivated to go up to this point, but not this far. But if okay. you have that belief, it limits you from the very start. So the question is, how do you have an expansive relationship with money with no limitations. And in my book, I call, talk about certificates of appreciation. What that means is if we have a business deal, a commercial deal, and I give you a service, you give me not money, but a certificate of appreciation. In other words, I have given you more benefit than the money you've given me. So, now here's the here's the part that is hard. <laughs> Some of my friends have a hard time uh, incorporating. In other words, if I'm delivering value to you, more value than the certificates of appreciation I receive, the more certificates I receive, the more value I've delivered to the world. So you talked about well, excess wealth or taking too much or being too greedy. If you are delivering value, the more certificates you uh, collect, the more value you have delivered. Now, there's a distinction. There are people in the U.S. like Martin Luther King and others who have delivered tremendous value to the world. In India, maybe you can tell me about who would be a hero that has nothing to do with money that's delivered. Who, who, who's the first name that would come to mind? Can you repeat your question? Yeah. Please? Who in India has delivered value to your country and to your citizens that has nothing to do with money? There are many, many people, many, many of them. Uh, there are businesses also. And if you talk in terms of businesses, then the Tata group is there. Uh, uh, they, they are right. but not business. Not they're not business people who have just sacrificed themselves. I I know I have some names in mind, but okay, politically. maybe you you can name Mahatma Gandhi. You have freedom right. fighters. So right. many of them, millions of them, who have sacrificed, and even today they are doing it, so many things without thinking of money. It means I may not recall so so many of right. them. Right. So and, let's and take Mahatma Gandhi. Yes. Right. So you can deliver value without money. Is that right? Right. Absolutely. Now, if everybody, if there was nobody taking care of the commercial side of life, there that that would be a big, dark, empty spot. So if you choose to be in the commercial side of life and deliver value, the more certificates you collect, the more value you've delivered. I just want to be very clear that there's many ways to deliver value to your family, to your community, to your country that has nothing to do with money. But the commercial side of life, without that, we would all starve to death. So what if we were to think of collecting certificates of appreciation as delivering value? Would that bring us to rapport with money? And for many of my clients, exactly what happens. Okay. Okay. So why are we then uh, embarrassed about extravagant health? Well, is it, is it bad thing or something? Why, why are we so embarrassed about it? That is a, such a good question. Why are we embarrassed if we are delivering value? And I think that that embarrassment, that twinge, like I will get a, a client and they are doing really well and they're saying, well, I'm making money so that I can become a philanthropist and give it away. Well, for me, that's not a good thing. That's a red flag because that means there's some guilt 
there's some, ooh, okay. it's kind of extravagant. Ooh, it's not quite right. I'm taking money from other people. Ooh, I, I've got to justify it. So I'm going to become a philanthropist and give it away. So with that attitude, I, I rework it so that the transaction in and of itself of delivering value, that's it. No guilt. Nothing further needs to be done. Now, a good-hearted person who does deliver a lot of value, does collect a lot of certificates of appreciation, they can then say, hmm, how else can I add value to the world now that I have these resources? But if you need that excuse to do it, that means there's still a twinge and some conflict inside of you. So you mean people with lots of money, uh, after a certain point in life, getting into philanthropy or a part of their uh, you know uh, money into philanthropy what would you would you call that is it because of some guilt or they are delivering value to the world or their community they can if they've delivered a lot of value to the world collected a lot of certificates it means they have a lot of skills talents they understand reality they understand people there's a huge amount of skill and having the power of then the resources to be able to deliver additional value in a different direction is wonderful. Okay. Okay. So uh, should I understand that if I'm doing some work and if I'm delivering value to, uh, to the person I'm working for, uh, is that delivering value and I'm getting my money for that, for that, what, it, 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 or, what you are talking is something different. No, I, I, you're exactly right. And, uh, and I really appreciate uh, a narrowing down on that. So if you're an employee and you deliver value to your employer and it gives you certificates of appreciation, if you're uh, an independent businessman and you deliver value and they give you certificates, if you're a boss and you give certificates to people who've delivered value to you. So imagine... What if tomorrow morning, everyone in the world woke up and said, huh, how can I deliver more value to the world? How can I deliver more value to my family, to my relatives, to my community, to my customers, my employers, my employees, my shareholders? How can I deliver more value to them? Let's say everybody woke up tomorrow how much more value would there be in the world? Holy mackerel, it would be a different world. There would be no limitations. There wouldn't be a single pie that everyone was fighting over. Oh my gosh, we would all experience that additional value and our lives would be richer and fuller. Okay, okay, Richard. Then uh, how does one know how much money is enough for him or her? How much money is enough for what? For him or her. For, for, oh, for him or her. Yeah. So that question itself has a premise. The okay. premise underneath that question is there's a limit okay. before you. there's too much. And the question now is how big is that limit? I'm saying the more value you deliver, there is no limit. Billion, trillion, it doesn't matter. The real question is delivering value, receiving more without any limits at all. If you have a sense there is a limit and how much is too much, that means there is a premise that you're not delivering value or somehow you're cheating the system by taking things out of it. If you, in fact, <clears throat> Excuse me. If you are cheating yeah. the system and you're taking value out of it rather than delivering value to it, I think that is like acid to the soul. That is spiritually destructive. And that eventually, in terms of karma, you're going to pay for it personally, even if you're very wealthy, if you're taking more money out of the system. So, no limits if you're delivering value and you can do it freely, completely, and with, uh, with delivering value and it can be a spiritual experience. Okay. So some company, if they are selling products and the promoter holds 
they ninety percent of the company's uh, shares, and ten percent is all in the for the public. So they are also delivering value and making money. Sometimes they have to take or they take decisions uh, which are not liked by people, or they say that the company has become uh, greedy. Or during COVID, many people fired a lot of employees in whatever manner that was that raised a lot of hue and cry. Now, in a way, they are a manufacturer of products. They do do give that product to the customers, whoever buy they buy. So, do you think they are delivering value? And if they are earning enough money by doing other things? Which may not like be liked by a lot of people. What does that mean? Is it delivering value the right way, or is it that they have done their part and that's all within uh, maybe uh, legally right? Morally, people look, look at it different differently. How do you say? I guess that's a lot of dilemma because if I were within that part of the system, I would perhaps feel different. And may, many people uh, they call it that it's like. Whistleblowers and all these things come out. People think that it's their conscience and it's their job to do and make it things right. How does how do you look from your point of view? Okay, so if you look at delivering value, and you deliver value to your customers, you pay your your employees, you deliver value to them. It's a value determined system. Now, if you're cheating your employees, if you're you know, firing them and putting pressure on them. If you are cheating your customers by delivering bad products, you, all those things are not delivering value. Now, people from the outs, let's say there's somebody who it does delivering value on all levels and they're making a lot of money. So there are people on the outside who in terms of their own lives are not delivering values to others. And they're going to be jealous, they're going to be angry, they're going to be resentful, and they're going to label that person as bad, even if he's delivering value. So it's a distinction between those who are delivering value and those who are cheating or being, uh, in terms of greed, trying to take more out of the system, take more value out of the system than they're delivering. So the question really is, are you delivering more value than you're receiving, or okay. are you receiving more value than you're delivering? So that for me is the criteria. And if I use that criteria, you know, us human beings are fallible, <laughs> except for me, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and you, and, you know, both of us, probably the two human beings on the earth that aren't fallible and make mistakes. I might fall off my chair. Yeah. <laughs> so. Since we're all fallible and we all make mistakes and that as humans get together, there's all sorts of issues and problems. Yes, that is true. But if we go to our higher spiritual level, and for some of us, it's going to be all very different. But for me, my highest spiritual level is delivering value to others. And this is how I can judge myself and how I can look at the world. And if I see somebody who is taking out of the system at more than they're delivering, then I can have a judgment about that that says, hey, you know, that's really not working for all of us. Now, that is very different than somebody who's delivering value, getting wealthy. I can praise them and say, you're doing great. So there is a distinction between those two in uh, terms of how much value we deliver. Right, Richard. So let me ask you uh, my question this way. You just talked about a spiritual uh, level and spiritual plane. Suppose a company who is into mining and they have a lot of, you know, people invested money into that company. Now, at that point in time, you may be thinking that I am doing the right sort of thing. I'm doing as much mining. I'm getting as much profit. Mm -hmm. And you see my shareholders are happy. Even common shareholders are happy because my stock price has gone up and they are very happy mm -hmm. after some time after some time because a lot of other steps that i i took while mining illegal mining can be there any other you know uh, 
evasion, tax evasion can be there, which comes to light after some years. At that point in time, you were thinking that you were delivering value and everything was looking so great. What about that part? For example, even during the 2008 crisis, a lot of toxic assets were, you know, bundled into whatever. And then, you know, yeah. the world. Yeah, you, you will understand this. You have you were a futures broker for Merrill Lynch and Pro Trader on the CME and CBOT. And, you know, specific exchange and all that stuff. You have been in responsible positions. Now also you have got, you are the founder of uh, founder and CEO of Mind Muscles Academy. So if you look at both the things, who determines whether you delivered value or not? And what is the time frame? My actions today can be fine in terms of, you know, shareholder value or any other value, because this is the moral dilemma for a lot of people. Now, some people are very hardened, battle hardened. They can deal with their conscience. Not everybody has that way of looking at it. So what is the time frame for this delivering value? Yeah, for if you are talking about individuals, maybe a dentist or a coach or a consultant or a doctor or anybody else or a teacher, he has done his part. He has given better value and uh, good value for what the uh, what he has charged. And he then is happy that he has done his job well. But in larger context, if you look at two examples that I uh, gave to you, how do you look? Because that is the thing. If people want to earn money and they have those moral dilemmas, how do you uh, assimilate or tackle those that stuff that your book I can understand? I understand is a lot about. Oh, that's perhaps one of the hardest questions that I can be asked. Because so, see, when you when you gave the example of a journalist, Joe, I've spent a lot many years in journalism with some of the top places. Now, sometimes from a news point of view, it looks okay, but when you look at you know in a different manner, sometimes it can lead to you know very different sort of understanding of that whole concept. It will be difficult to explain in this in this podcast, but I, I, I guess you understand what I mean. So sometimes you just don't know more. Uh, technically, you may be doing the right thing, but uh, morally or in terms of delivering value, the result will come in the future. OK, so this is a hard question, but it is the right hard question. So we can imagine a scenario where you mentioned somebody's mining and they have the byproducts of the mining and they dump it to a stream and it poisons the cattle and ruins the ecology going downstream. They say, oh, short term, I'm delivering value to my clients. But if we look at the larger ecosystem, we are destroying part of it and we are taking value. So like country, some countries, developing countries, they can uh, produce products for cheaper because they are not taking in the cost of the destruction, the ecological destruction they're doing. So they're delivering value to a very narrow segment. The, right. the buyers are their product, but they are taking value from the, their community and the world in order to deliver that very narrow segment. So spiritually in our world, you know, I invite people to say, are we delivering value as a whole, not only to our customers and our products, <clears throat> but the world as a whole? And we can do that by, I think it takes a process of higher spiritual values to be able to do that. Now, the risk is that we go the other way. In the United States, we have something called ESG. Uh, environment, social, uh, oh, I forget what the other is. Where governance. What? Governance. Yeah, where companies are required to do all this vague stuff. Right. And as a result, they lose focus on what the value they're delivering. And it is in an extreme, it's kind of this dissipate thing that nobody knows what to do, but we just kind of try to get. Uh, uh, what is it? Branding approval around something. And again, we are actually going the other way and we're not delivering value. And 
So it's a really hard question. I think it is ultimately a spiritual question. And uh, if we can say that some people are going to deliver value very narrowly, other people more, it's going to take all types of this. We are valuable as human beings. We make self-corrections as we go. And I invite everybody to broaden their definition of delivering value as a way of not only healing ourselves, but the world around us. Right, Richard, right. In India, long, long back, we had somebody called King Ashok. He wanted to conquer another place. He did that, but he saw so much of bloodshed. And then he realized that it was of no use. Mm -hmm. To win anybody, the simplest way is to win hearts. And so he turned into Buddhists. He went through the Buddhism way and he spread Buddhism all his life. Mm -hmm. So it all depends on where you find that conquest, where you find your value, where you find that thing. But as you rightly said that value cannot be just seen in a very narrow sense. And that is where, where, where when those narrow, narrow caves open up, then the higher plane of spirituality comes in. And then that is where you call is self-actualization. Everybody is struggling for security needs. Perhaps that makes them look at money very bit differently. But at the end of the day, when you meet Mr. Maslow and you talk about self-actualization, that perhaps you look at things differently. My questions were perhaps, you know, looking at all aspects of this whole, uh, whole stuff and not purely from a point of view of just, you know, having a very limited sort of understanding of money. So let it be as it is. I'm sure money is also as important as, as, as anything else. And without it, the world will not run for you and you won't have food to eat, at least in today's time. So it's better that everybody is prepared and have a mindset which helps them earn enough money, generate wealth for themselves as well as their children. That's what and, I understand. That's so wise. And in our book and in our online course, we have exercises that help step you through to a higher level of value delivering and to look at all the conflicting be beliefs that no longer serves you. So I encourage everybody uh, to go to the web page and uh, you can post that and to right. get the online course. And if they read the book, they can see Joe's journey, his own spiritual journey, and they can relate to it and understand it and take that journey with him. Right, right. My last question to you, Richard, is about what is money positive community? Oh, a money positive community is one where we celebrate your victories. We celebrate your rapport with money. We celebrate when you get certificates of appreciation. We celebrate wealth when you deliver value. We also look at, you know, the as human beings, that where we can go to extreme that where where money is used to uh, validate us or to make us important or to to prove something to the world. So in a money positive community, we we celebrate the real highest values of delivering money and caution people about the val the behaviors that don't serve them or serve the world. So money positive community, we have online uh, meetings where people can really celebrate uh, their their victories, their wealth, their meaning, and their success. Right, Richard. Right. So how do people become part of this community? How do, and where do they get to buy your book? Thirdly, how can people engage with you? How can they, you know, connect with you so that they can take your services like other clients do? Excellent. Uh, I'm not sure about it in India, but I believe that if uh, you can uh, go to Amazon and uh, Conversations with Money by Richard Friesen, uh, okay. you can go to our website, conversations.money, 
and there's there. And if you go to conversations.money slash K-A-J, uh, we will give you a special invitation to take the online course. So there's just lots of way. And there's lots of free, at just just uh, blogs on, on the website that just deal with a lot of issues. So even if you don't want to step in and join us in our money positive community, there's lots of good stuff to read that may be helpful. Right, right. Thank you so much, uh, Richard, for all these insights into money. And though I went a bit onto the spiritual side, but sometimes, as I said about King Ashok and about shareholder value, when you when you talk of shareholder value, but you are the biggest shareholder and uh, of, of your company, obviously, uh, you know, and then you get the biggest value. The only thing is that you should not take away value from the community to build your own value in a negative manner. Right. If you build value by delivering value, we can all celebrate your victories. Right. right. Thank you very much. With this, it's a wrap on this very special edition with Richard Preston. Thank you once again. Thank you.